Hello, friends. Bring you greetings on this beautiful day, and I praise God for the gift of this day and for our time together to be in the Word and to be in the Gospel of John. I'm excited to go on this journey with you. And uh, if you were here yesterday, you got to have a little bit of an introduction. If you didn't get a chance to, to go through that, I invite you to go back. It's just like five or six minutes, and it starts the introduction to this book to understand the, the context a little bit. And so I want to invite you to spend some time there. Today we're going to continue on with the introduction, and then we're going to get into just the first couple of verses of the gospel. So you can open your Bible to chapter 1 and be ready for that, but let us continue to talk about uh, just a little introductory material to understand the, the purpose behind John and, and some other images here. So most, you know, most scholars agree that this was written by the Apostle John who walked with Jesus. There are some, and you'll find this in your Bibles uh, sometimes, where they'll do an introduction to this book, and they'll talk about questioned authorship, that it may have been somebody else who actually did the writing. Um, I, I want to just get us into the element of this clearly denotes the life of John the Apostle. It, it, there's many, many different points in which that is introduced. And, you know, I don't want to argue the authorship. Maybe it was John himself. Maybe it was somebody who was with him. I don't think that's the important part. The important part is the message that is communicated here. It's, it's what was actually written down, because John is very unique in the sense that it's unlike the other three Gospels. The other three Gospels are what we call the synoptics or the similar Gospels. They have a lot of the same stories in them, and they follow kind of a historical account of Jesus' life. John goes off on I, I, yes, it's it's a historical account, but he doesn't include the whole storyline. And John seems to uh, omit things that the others are writing down and include things that the others don't uh, don't even place in there. They don't even make reference to. A, a for instance, might be that uh, there is no mention in the Gospel of John about Jesus' baptism, about his temptation, about his transfiguration. There's really nothing in terms of the Last Supper in terms of how Matthew, Mark, and Luke introduced the Last Supper. Instead, what John does is John focuses on the washing of the feet, something that we don't see at all in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's just very interesting to see what John's, what his vision is. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the, the old story of, of taking, you know, three blind people and, and putting them around an elephant, one at the tail, one at the trunk, and, and one underneath at the belly, and asking them to describe the elephant. And they obviously get three very, very different images that they, uh, that they communicate. And in a lot of ways, it feels like, like John is that different image. He's the one that he's seeing things from a different perspective. And I love this because it helps us to... Uh, I guess it helps us to, to connect with God from a different perspective. Matthew connecting from the point of a sinner, but also from the point of a Jewish insider. Mark is a guy who's, who's truly, you know, centered in action. And, and he loves, he, he's also a Jewish insider, but he loves the image of, I mean, just the, the action, the engagement in the story, the actions of Jesus, of his miracles. Of Luke is an outsider. He's a Gentile. But he's a very learned man. I mean, he's, a, he's a physician. John, we get into a little bit more of a theological book where, where he's arguing that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Messiah, and that we, each one of us, must choose to believe or not to believe. This was really a vital thing in the writing of this letter because what was going on and who, who John appeared to be addressing were Jewish believers and those who were on the fringes of belief, those who didn't yet believe, were struggling with it, were enticed by it, but there were Greek philosophers out there who were forming these philosophical arguments contending that Jesus wasn't truly human. Now, if Jesus wasn't truly human, then his sacrifice on the cross did not carry that ability to be a sacrifice on our behalf. It just became kind of a a God act, a God thing to say, oh, well, look what I did for you. You should come and worship me. It would completely undermine the sacrifice that Jesus made. And so we have this image going on in John and, and who he's writing to. The storyline that he writes is, is not the whole story, but John has something unique in his writing in that he, he frequently looks back to say, well, this is what's going on and this is what things were like prior to Jesus. 
And then here is Jesus. And then the ultimate challenge of where will things go after the story is told? So in other words, after the gospel is delivered, what will people do with it? After the message of Jesus is passed on, what will people do? Will they embrace Jesus? Will they choose to believe or will they walk away? And, and John presents us with this question many, many, many times. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's an exciting book. It's a book that uh, you can get into as a very new believer. Um, it's also a book that you can get into throughout the entire journey of your belief. You can be an immersed believer who has studied this book and prayed over this book and, and immersed yourself in it all your life long. And it, would, it will continue to open up. It will continue to, to nurture you in your faith. So it's a great book. I, I look forward to going through this gospel with you. And uh, I just praise God. It's... <laughs> It's good. Uh, let's get into the first couple verses here. We're going to read just verses one, 1 and 2 because this is so powerful and so packed full with meaning. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So I want to talk about that in the beginning image because the place where we come across, I made reference yesterday that this is actually the, uh, the, the first two verses of the entire, if you were to write the Bible chronologically, these are the two verses that belong first overall in the entire Bible. The reason is, is that if you go back to the book of Genesis, you see in Genesis 1 to 1, in the beginning, God. And then it goes through the, the account of God creating, God creating the heavens and the earth, the day and the night, the, you know, God going through the, the full element of creation. And what John opens up here is that in the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, in the beginning, we have this image of the Son, or of the Messiah. We have this image of the threefold God, because in Genesis it talks about the Spirit sweeping over the waters. We have the image of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and this is something that we, we, we struggle to explain, because the idea of three things being completely synonymous, completely in sync, in sync, and yet completely distinct, is it's beyond our comprehension in this world. We have nothing truly like that. And I've heard a host of explanations trying to explain, you know, it's like, well, God is like the, the, the wick and the wax and the flame. I mean, it just, no matter what you come up with, it, some people talk about how it's the relationship. I am a son and a father and a husband. And a, Friends, I, I've never found anything that really communicates it without undermining the nature of, of the triunity of God. What I look at here and what John is saying is in the beginning, in other words, before Genesis, when Genesis says in the beginning God created, it's communicating, that's the word Genesis. Genesis means in the beginning. It talks about at the origin of our time, God already was. At the origin of our time, the word already existed. The word already was. In other words, the, this, this image of the triunity, it was already present. It was already in the existence. There's nothing that, that's before it. And so we have this image here where John is opening up to the fact that he's talking about this Messiah, this son, our savior, and he's opening up from, from the very beginning words to say, he was not created, he was not crafted, he was not purposed at some point in human history. He was there at the dawn, at the beginning, at the creation of the world. It says he was with God and he was God. And, and, and we see it as the word. Okay, the word was with God, the word was God. And then in verse two, he was with God in the beginning. It's identifying that synonymous. He is the living word, the embodiment of the word of God. And that embodiment of the word was sent down to live with us, to be a witness to us. Yes, he walked with John and Peter and Nathaniel and and. Bartholomew and all yes he walked with them and he he was encountered by many many others but that message has been passed down through the ages and we have the words of this book the words that we continue to immerse ourselves in that it may shape our lives we continue to learn about our God to worship God to seek God with the whole of our heart knowing that God is the author of all that Father Son and Holy Spirit this triunity of God were present at the dawn of creation of the heavens and the earth all the way down to the creation of humanity and we live in the presence of this messiah this messiah that lives 
in our hearts, the Holy Spirit that has been purposed in our lives. Friends, we're going to go on this journey, and John is going to, to open up to us that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Messiah, and that we have to choose, belief or unbelief. We have to choose every day. Belief is not something that we, we come to one point in our life and we make a confession in front of the church. We say, okay, I believe I've got this now. Our belief in God is a choice to say yes every day because this world will throw its philosophies at us. And it does, you know that. The world throws its philosophies at us, its arguments that we should live for ourselves, that there is no God. The world throws its philosophies at us just as the people in, in John's day had philosophies thrown at them. It argued that they put, could not put trust in God, that Jesus wasn't truly human, that this salvation thing is, is all but a hoax. We choose to believe every day. We choose to live as a people who trust in the salvation and the grace and the love of God. Our God who sent the Son to be our Savior. We choose to believe and to trust in how he will lead our life day by day by day. It's not a wrestling so much between, once we believe, it's not so much a, a wrestling between belief and unbelief, but it's that continually reaffirming that we believe lest we fall into unbelief. The world will throw a host of confusions and Satan will throw a, a, just a plethora of, of arguments to try and get us to turn away and to doubt. But every day we rise up and we choose to, to believe and when we come across the words of Scripture, we come across points in our Christian walk where we're struggling or where we're confused or where we're frustrated. Our answer is not to turn to the world and seek an answer, but rather to turn right back to the Scriptures and right back to, to communication with our God through prayer and right back to the body of believers that we may turn and, and come to know again the truth about every circumstance. So friends, let us go on this journey together. I'm excited. I'm excited to see how John unfolds to me and to you as we walk on this journey. So let us be in prayer. And let us be ready tomorrow as we continue in chapter one with the word. Praise be to God. Friends, let us go forth and know always that God loves you.